because I played sports and because I'm a watercolorist, among my uh, academic friends, I was known as a jock, highly suspicious as a consequence. And among my athletic friends, the, this guy does watercolors and he travels around. Clearly, his manhood has got to be questioned. <laughs> so I had this incredible conflict. So that's what that. Uh, but I must say, I mean, since the rugby blue, life's been downhill. <laughs> um, I'm going to deal with the spirit of place in two in two ways. Tonight, I want to deal with it as a, in terms of location, the context of why buildings of importance are located, and how they attempt to get significance. This, tomorrow night I want to deal with buildings themselves, but the way in which they get authenticity, and how what obligations we have in a world of diminishing resources and environmental and climatic change, how we should respond to that. So in terms of tonight, let me just you can see that through time, various echelon of society have tried to give their buildings an importance, imbue them with something special, something unusual, beyond the ordinary buildings of everyday life. And I've divided them up by location, by design, and by reference. That is referring to and the first attempts at this by the Greeks that in the Western world of real significance, that's Cape Sunium. In fact, it's when Menelaus came back from Troy, that was his first point, when he came back from on his voyage. And you can see by placing it, the thing's not working. Right, can I get your technician because the space is not working? Thank you. I'll use those. Uh, and that's the same place, not a very good picture. But you can see that poised at the edge of the land, where water comes together, becomes a significant effect. It has a very special prominence in that kind of location. Of course, we all know the Parthenon on that well. What's perhaps not as well known is that the Greek idea of space, this prominence on the Acropolis, obviously giving it prominence not so much by the edge of water and land where they meet, which is a, an important definer, does it by the height, uh, by its elite status. And the Greeks also liked you to look at it and prepare you for it in a very subtle way. The ways in which you had to climb gave you different views of these uh, preliminary buildings, as it were, before you got to the Epirectio and the Parthenon. You view them from different angles, and then you came through a gateway. And that idea of popular or a gateway, preparing you to enter sacred ground, a threshold. It's one of the differences, in a way, and I'll deal with that tomorrow a little bit, between contemporary architecture and classical architecture. If you want to make a really uh, simple distinction, classical architecture, you knew the boundaries of the room. There's a threshold, there are windows, there are doors, there are corners to the walls. If you look at the classical, or not the classical, in proper use of that word, but if you look at the archetypical contemporary piece, the Barcelona Pavilion by Mies van der Rohe, deliberately destroying the definitions of where the roof begins and ends. Petitions end like that, not touch one another. The roof doesn't conform to the plan. So it's a very deliberate attempt to demolish the definition of the room. If you want a creative specialness to the space, you define that space very clearly. The Timonos, the whole of that cluster defined by a wall, entering across a threshold into the sacred space, demarcate your position of moving gradually by viewing it from different positions till you gradually come to the proper land, then into the sacred ground. So that creates a special quality to it just like that. If you look at this one, this is Lindos, very dramatically so at the edge of a cliff, right at the edge of the cliff water, and there it sits above the village. <clears throat> and if you stand here, it's quite extraordinary how you can see down to the sea below. It's the drama of the place, 
It's edge, it's sitting on the edge of this cliff. The relationship of land to water gives it its significance. And of course it's not just in Western cultures. Machu Picchu at a very high point, but has another relationship. And while I have talked about the location and by design and by reference, some of them combine all three. For example, the Temple of the Sun here was positioned so that the window accepted the light at solstice to light the altar. So the relationship to the heavens, that's a referential one, the third component, is combined here by its locus on a very high peak, special place, and then relating it to the heavens. That relationship to the heavens is used in many cultures and it goes a long way back. <clears throat> one I know a little better. This is at the confluence of the Kidron and the Hinon valleys, and it is of course the Temple Mount, the temple which stood where now the Dome of the Rock stands, and its proper layer is in fact the al aqsa Mosque. So from the Stone Age village of Shiloh, you came up through this climbing up to Mount Moriah, and my, it's a pure conjecture on my part, but I imagine <clears throat> that the very early villages would have a place to win out the wheat, and you would go to a, a, a place where there is a breeze and a wind, you climb the mountain, and how much better to have a rock face in which you could thresh the corn after you'd thrown it into the air. You could also imagine that that became the place in which important gatherings would take place. So gradually, through a kind of patina of use, it became more and more sacred. And of course now the Muslims claim that Muhammad jumped to heaven, you can see his footprint in the rock, uh, where he jumped to heaven. And it's of course where most of the Abrahamic religions really look to. As a consequence, almost every church, synagogue and mosque faces east. It's referential in its importance. It's borrowing its importance from the significance of its origins. So that's another aspect of the referential nature of giving a building importance. The Mirab or the Aran Kodesh, the altar, facing east. But this whole piece of land over here is so imbued with all kinds of history of ours. And I think that there is a significance simply by that patina. Uh, the, the Mount of Olives in Gethsemane sits just behind us on this picture. And on the other side is the, uh, known as an arch, I forgot the name of the Englishman who discovered it, of how you got up to the main city. But there it is, at the edge of this valley, combining its it's the patina of use over a period of time, giving it its great significance. So when I was uh, presented with designing the city hall for the city, I wanted to continue and make reference to the old city because of its continuity. Uh, these are the Armenian buildings, and Tsar Nicholas II built the first buildings by European outside the walls in the 19th century. And in fact, some of these buildings, it was a mess when I got hold of it, but the trick was here was how do you take these buildings that are unrelated and end up with something to see as if it were designed intentionally. So these are existing buildings and uh, this one over here is a Nicholas building, behind that is another one. But this is the edge of the wall of the old city and so the ways in which I always carry a sketchbook, this is the proper layer of how you come up from the valley below up to the Temple Mount. <coughs> um, and then the Temple Mount itself with its great plaza, so to speak, the cotton market, and the whole of Jerusalem is made up of these tiny alleyways, open spaces, and it's a variety of spaces in a planar method as the Greeks did in a vertical method of you experiencing the city in a different way. And so, the, from the Jaffa Gate, it leads straight up to the, the, uh, the pieces that now constitute the city hall as a complex rather than as a single building, ending up in a doorway, placing significance to the doorway. But going through the doorway, you get to the road that once the uh, prophets took 
And in fact, what's fascinating is that there's a mention in the Bible of a view of Acre, Akor, from the top of that hill. Nobody believed it until the building was demolished recently. We got a view of Akor. So, and to join that, I will deal with this a little bit tomorrow. We kept uh, 10 of the 11 buildings on the site, <clears throat> had a clear one, at least significant. But in clearing it and taking the overburden off the site to build a parking garage below, we came across a Crusader aqueduct. Where it stopped. I thought, that's it. Uh, the archaeologist came along and said, oh, only 11th century. <laughs> I made a record of it and keep digging. Which we did. But then we found a stone that was thought to be from the Third War. Now, from that position of the temple, the old city, with its walls, those were easily defended. But at the other end of it, where there's a plain that rises above that, which is where the Tenth Legion finally conquered Jerusalem, the inhabitants kept building a wall, and building it out as the city grew, and that was the vulnerable spot. Christ, being a Jew, was buried outside the wall, outside the Third Wall. So the discovery of the third wall is a position of great significance in the Western world. So when we found this stone, thought was that it was the third wall. Once again, the archaeologists, priests, rulers, rabbis, all there. <clears throat> again, I thought no project. They decided in the end that it had been cannibalized by the crusaders to build a leper colony outside the wall. So it wasn't the third wall. So that and uh, the amphora that we came across from Solomon's granary, Get you goosebumps. That, that went off to the museum, and of course the wall that went off to the museum, and we continued building. But I did restore, you'd be happy to see, the aqueduct. So I positioned it back once it was once. Um, so now we look at another Christian example of a very similar thing. And this is one of the most extraordinary pieces of architecture in establishing its position in the, in the landscape. And this is Assisi, where the monastery and the church sit at the very edge of this promontory with the town here. Interestingly enough, and I'll show you Notre Dame that has adopted something similar, of an open space before it, almost, I shouldn't say genuflect, but because that's too, that's too pretentious, but a kind of pause before between the town and to give the building significance. There's an antechamber, a forecourt, an apron, if you like, to appreciate the building and the architecture of the entrance. In a sense, a repetition of the proper layout or the, or the threshold to make it clear when you enter. There isn't any question about where you enter. That's a prompt landscape below. So the building stretches along, creating its own necropolis, so to speak, with the church in that location. But look at the front, how different it is. It's very clear where the doorway is. There isn't any mistaking it. So it's creating the importance by having the forecourt, in this case a wonderful lawn, which is important not to paint it because the difference between the paved and completely stone-made village the stone building, having a green forecourt, makes it emphasizes that point all the more. And then, without question, where the doorway is. So you enter that sacred space extremely consciously. We have our own building that has that kind of importance. Those are the Houses of Parliament. We sit on that edge. That gives it its importance. In this case, too, symbolically, well, that's what made the Quebec connection. But it can be seen from Quebec. I don't know if there's a metaphor there for uh, other kinds of tenuous relationships, but it isn't tenuous at all in the way in which it sits on the landscape. Now, Notre Dame, as I mentioned, sits at the edge of that island. It really does have the most extraordinary location, and it's not on the mainland, it is on an island. And from one side, and I want to talk about the flying buttresses tomorrow and dealing with the authenticity of buildings. We'll deal with that tomorrow. But again, how different the forecourt 
the preparation to enter the building, the appreciation of the building standing free. I'll come back to make reference to this, particularly in terms of St. Petersburg. It's a freestanding building. It has a doorway, a forecourt, and then the building behind it. It's an interesting relationship. So that's all of those, in a sense, by location. Moving to a second kind, where there aren't geographic features that give you prominence, either by being at the edge of the, at the, edge of the, of the coast or on a mountain top, but it's man-made. The, 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 the Europeans treat opera houses as just as important as any building there is. And if you see the Garnier Opera House, the confluence of angled streets that end up with the opera house closing the vista and giving it importance where it is not part of a block. It's a freestanding building. This is what I consider giving it importance by design. There's a consciousness to design the, the context in a way that elevates the building to significance by giving it pride of place. And this is an extraordinarily successful component of it. The, the, the Church of the Motherland is another wonderful example, not by, by, uh, by diagonal or streets, but this wonderful vista that comes right across the bridge, across the sand, along an open space, up a street with this terminating the vista in the most dramatic and wonderful way. It doesn't have to be, have, be elaborate, but because of its position, although the portico, interestingly enough, is a very welcoming device. You can, by design, make a building welcoming or, in fact, repelling. If you see a, 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 a door that has bosses on it, painful if you hit it, and it's proud of the wall. Notice how many jails have that. It stands proud of the wall. If you put the, make the door recede into a space, there's a shadow of protection from the rain where you can stand in comfort while waiting, that's welcome. So the portico is a gesture of welcome. And of course, columns themselves have a certain nobility. It's amazing how the Nibel Riche wanted to make it look like a grand house put five columns out front. It's a symbol of that nobility, borrowed and sometimes fake, but it is interesting that people do that. Another one by design, in a fairly flat landscape, the Bayans built these buildings so that they rose above the jungle. They became themselves, in a way, the artifact that distinguished them from everywhere else. And their orientation is also to the solstice, to lunar eclipses, and other natural phenomena with great precision. So they accomplish their importance by relating to the heavens in some fashion, but also by giving them this mass. I found interesting too, and I want to deal with that tomorrow, about monumentality. The essence of monumentality is stability that will be there forever. If you have a building that is, has no visible means of support, as you can think of some in our city, as well as in others, they don't have that sense of longevity. They're teetering on little sticks or something. So, uh, the fact is that... But what's interesting about this is that in the pyramids in Egypt, and in this, so those of your engineers will know that it's close to the angle of repulsors. When you pile dirt up, just throw it onto it, it'll slide, but it'll come to a stability point, and that angle is the angle of repose. That's the ultimate monumentality. So this building doesn't, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and it stayed there for a long time, and it of course, displays its monumentality as another aspect of giving the building significance beyond the ordinary. We have it in Washington. Longfellow's design for Washington which is being clear that's the mall, Capitol, the White House. All of these great streets end up the Treasury Building, so at the end of the mall, the Lincoln Memorial. They give their buildings of state prominence by design, by locating them at the ends of these vistas. That's how they get that. It's such a stunning example of it. And I don't know if what you feel when you go to Washington, but to me it's like entering a, an imperial city. I imagine that's what Rome felt like. And it uses the devices of Rome to 
create that kind of sense of gravel man. But here's a classic example of importance by design, the Washington Monument and the Capitol. And we have our own. You thought about this. <laughs> no, I don't mean this as a few point of pathos. I'm full of admiration. <coughs> Toronto has given its public buildings, unlike many American cities apart from Washington, its public buildings in importance. Just think of it. Old City Hall, top of Bay Street. Oscar Hall, top of York Street. The Queen's Park at the top of University Avenue. Grover, the old Grover building, top of Spadina. And even the school. Gave, they gave up a kind of college importance, breaks the grid. Only buildings in Toronto that break the grid are buildings of importance. And I compliment Canadians for having done that. I remember being in a fight to stop Eaton's taking over old city hall. And it was an easy battle to win. Because this building had such significance, you would never record it to a commercial enterprise. So we've done very well, and I want to protect that. Um, those are the other examples. Uh, even even uh, Ryerson at the head of a small street, that's the one at the UFT, as you all know, at the head of Spadina. There it is there. And working in St. Petersburg, they did it by design, but in a slightly rather different manner. You can see the elements of it here. But the schedule, actually, that's uh, the use of the palace, that's where Rasputin was thrown into the canal, right there. Anyway, these streets and canals are lined with classical buildings of tremendous consistency. And it's not just a few streets. The, 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 the mass of buildings, the extent of it, the, the, the magnitude of this city in its consistency is remarkable. There are no parking lots that break up these buildings. The streetscapes are completely continuous. They're all made up of a very similar architecture, built, of course, over a fairly uh, compressed period of time, but still perhaps over 100 or 200 years. Notice the elements of it. Vertical shaped windows, plaster masonry bases, metal roofs, and the portico to identify the entrance, broken by, in this case, St. Isaac's Cathedral, but there are many cathedrals, like the Cathedral of the Blood. So you can have an extraordinary building of this kind because it's in contrast to the aggregate. It gains its importance by its difference, by its contrast, by its materials that are completely different, and its freestanding. That's very important, that it stands on its own ground, not touched by anybody else, not contaminated by every day. So, I draw this little diagram for you. That's the freestanding building inside a block of standard buildings. To do that in a street clearly is inappropriate. Like that. <laughs> it breaks the continuity of the that. It may or may not be a good museum. That's the Guggenheim, Frank Lloyd Wright's great architect. But in the wrong place. Although, of course, as a museum it has its difficulties. You see, building, you can only see the paintings very close to or across the ramp, and you're walking down a sloping ramp, so you're always <laughs> not sure which way to look at the picture. But it doesn't work that way. So while I was had huge pressure to build a significant so-called iconic building in St. Petersburg, against all the um, pitching of everybody locally, I stayed with a building that produces the continuity a masonry base, vertically proportioned windows, not in a classic rhythm, but syncopated, and a metal roof. We'll come back to that a little bit tomorrow. So, by reference, the final component I want to deal with tonight, Stonehenge being the perfect one. It's on a flat plane, no distinguishing geography to this, but the measurements, and they, they dragged, this is the Stone Age period, dragged um, stone pieces weighing tons. How they did it, I have no idea. I don't think anybody does. And with a precision to see to it that the sun's rays precisely at the equinox were slicing through the building in a pre-designed manner. So here's a building clearly must have been the locus of old ritual, given its significance by its 
heavenly connection. I found another interesting thing. This is in one of my first essays in, in Ontario. I had to extend the, 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 the local city hall in Newcastle. And there's a memorial, a war memorial, that's been erected that has no, there's no grave under it. It has no relationship to anything. I wanted to move it. The veterans would have none of it. It had, it had assumed or achieved a significance by its location, simply by its use, not by anything else, and it became sacred. So we had to build around it. I, I found that absolutely fascinating. So what I'm going to conclude with is, uh, this is a, a, an entry of an international competition to revitalize, redo Yad Vashem, the memorial to the Holocaust. We were finalists. I won't go through the machinations of the final result, but we didn't get the building in the end. But I'm taking all these things, and I hadn't thought it through that well the next day, but there were the components that were there. And you can see that what I was attempting to do was to take the memorial and relate it to the Temple Mount. That's the Temple Mount, this is Jerusalem, and these are the valleys. The difficulty here, many people lost their faith having gone through the Holocaust. No one could believe a, a good God could let people suffer and be done like that. And so, when you deal with a memorial of that kind, do you deal with it in its blackness? Or do you, in fact, without any justification for those who went through it, give them hope? Should the memorial have both light and dark? Obviously, as life goes on, I chose to make it so that there would be light as well as dark acknowledging how terrible it was. And you can see here that simply from not the map, but this is an aerial photograph relating the lining, the alignment through Mount Herzl all the way through to the old city. And the arrival point is important as I've tried to demonstrate in all of those historical examples I gave you. Just to digress for a minute, what's fascinating to me is that why is San Francisco such a successful city when it does the most stupid thing? If you were an intelligent planner, you'd put the streets on the contour. But there's a grid that lies straight over the contours, man. But what it gives you is orientation. As you come over the hill, you can see the whole city, you know where you are in the city. That's one of its great satisfactions. Buildings that have science, you tell you every go, everywhere you know that the planning wasn't successful. And same with cities. Pope Sixtus V, I understood that. The obelisks that he put were markers for pilgrims to find their way from monument to monument until they got to St. Peter's. And so I wanted people to have a sense of this huge area. So there were some important markers. You arrived at this location, an orientation center. This is existing, so it's where the eternal flame is. And then there is here, uh, dug into the hillside, uh, a memorial to the obliterated towns in which there were a majority of Jews in Eastern Europe. And because six million is an abstraction, it doesn't mean, if you said five million is different to six million, it doesn't mean that much. So what I did was to get each column in this column which would give orientation to the whole campus. Uh, put 6,000 names and have 600 columns. So it would personalize it, that there'd be a name, and if there wasn't a known name, there'd be a marker for the unknown person. So you had to walk among the columns with all these names, surrounded by the dead. So that these columns gave you a scale to it, and cut into the hillside. This is obviously a place to walk in the very hot sun, you need shade. As we look for sun here, you look for shade there. And cutting into the monument is a tradition to that. This is Absalom's tomb, cut into the rock of the Hinnon Valley just outside the walls of old Jerusalem. It's buried into the, into the, that's cut into the hillside. You have to go down steps down to get to it, which I found 
very, very instructive. But not to, not to be overwhelming with the death, and you'll note that I did not try for a moment to do what the Washington Yad Vashem monuments done. It's trying to replicate the environment or the atmosphere of a concentration camp. To me, that can't work. You, it's presumptuous to think that you can replicate the sense of what those people went through and what it was like to be like that. You make references to it by the piles of glasses or shoes, but not to try and to me, it's a kind of Disney attitude of recreating something without authenticity. It can never be the real thing. Don't try. But to give hope, I cut views into the landscape. So as you went down this six million names, there were components of the landscape that you pointed to, and that's where the eternal flame is. To look at the Jerusalem landscape, sunlit, olive trees, life, that there is hope. And so, in fact, I thought that the column should be made of basalt because it's almost indestructible. And the black, at least in Western world, has a funereal quality. But there are the cut views through the hillside. Uh, of course, artifacts such as a cattle car, to remind one of the horror, these trains still get my way. I took a train in Germany and it, 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 it gave me a really odd feeling, very strange and odd feeling. But the landscape beyond, while this is deliberately poised over an abyss, the metaphor is obvious, but inside, even at the current one, which is not a great building, there is, there is some light that comes in through this oppressive roof. And so, using those kinds of ideas, the design of the buildings themselves would bring in clear story light, that you'd go through seeing the artifacts, being taken through a museum as you normally would, but not in the dark, not giving panoramic views so that it was as if you were not in the building. You're in the building and you're dealing with a very tough subject, but always some natural light. And then finally, coming out, an avenue with nothing to do with the museum. A restitution, an attempt to bring you back to life, and go down an avenue of trees so that in the end, the golden light of Jerusalem, life goes on. Thank you. So you can see the um, the old city. Um, so there's a mountain between, and up here you can see. So from here you can see that, and from there you can see that. So absolutely, there's an alignment that's intentional. I don't know much about that, so I can't answer your question. The Empire State Building 
does stand pretty well, doesn't it? In my recollection, isn't it a freestanding building or are there buildings connected to it? There are buildings. Well, if it's a commercial building, I have no problem with it being connected to other buildings. I mean, it's not, it's, it was, would be as if we had Ethan's take over the uh, old city hall if we were to consider that to be a sacred building. So I don't, I don't think it's relevant in that respect because the buildings I've been dealing with here are not everyday buildings. They're buildings of some sacred nature, some buildings that were all to do with ritual or memorial. So there's a, there, I've, I've tried, to, I've attempted to give where there are buildings of significance. How does architecture uh, elevate that building to a significance that it would not have if it were not in that location? If it wasn't with those uh, references, if it wasn't designed in a way that focused attention on it. Jack, uh, let's bring it back to Toronto and the yes. sort of the falling arts. If I had had my way, it would have been built on the harbour. On the harbour. Yes. Would that have been preferable? How would you have? Uh, would you have? designed it differently mm -hmm. and the fact that it's a meeting place, Toronto is a meeting place, mm -hmm. would the reference to that have been much greater than what now is? Um, and the, the issue for the, the, the Opera House, uh, much like the one in, in, in St. Petersburg, fills the whole block. One of the things that I admire about Toronto, it's distinct from most American cities, is it's got a continuous street case, streetscapes, which currently are being broken up. I, I highly disapprove of the way in which the planning of the city is going on at the moment, where those streetscape continuities that provide all kinds of benefits, social benefits, security benefits, uh, weather protection, microclimate benefits, and so forth. And so uh, I did not want, and of course there is an architect, want to make each one of their buildings an, uh, an so-called iconic building. Uh, if they're all iconic, you have a cacophony. What you have here, you. the continuity and aggregate, that's better. I wanted to add to the aggregate. Maybe it's too modest, but I want to deal with that tomorrow. Just to give you the theme, the best architectural solutions come from a resolution of opposing requirements of apparently irreconcilable differences. That you want a building to be part of the continuity, but it also has to be special. So I'll leave you with that. But it's on the subway. You can go to the, you can go to the opera by subway. And it should, and then I made every attempt to remove the elitist notion from the opera house. And so the glass front is a capture of the sidewalk. The Troll Opera House is the only opera house in North America in which the average occupancy from the time it opened is 93%. And more importantly, the average age is dropping year over year. And what I attribute that to is that people passing by, if you have a building that's closed with a tiny entrance, there's a kind of elitism and exclusion to that. If it's apparently open and transparent, and you see the lunchtime concerts, you see people gathering, there's a sense of occasion gathering for a concert. They may be in jeans or in that time doesn't matter, there are people there. So the accessibility coming by subway, transparency, seeing the sense of occasion, could not happen on the waterfront. This is not this is part of the action and activity of the city. And that's why I think it succeeds. So yes, but your comment on, on Montreal is having major buildings. Well Montreal is doing pretty well at the moment. <clears throat> And I just had occasion to build a new, a new Maison Symphonique, La Maison Symphonique in Montreal on the, on the plaza. The plaza itself was a mistake, in my view, the Place des Arts, because it had a podium and elevated its cultural buildings onto this podium. The last thing you want to do is to remove it from the street, I think. So making it accessible. So when we built the, the, the symphony hall, I deliberately put on the edge of the plaza an entrance on the street. And you can come in from the metro. But the, oh, but the, the Montreal is currently a building public spaces that we could be I'm envious of. And they're spending money on public spaces. We have so few really great public spaces, particularly for our climate. The principal public space in Toronto is the sidewalk. 
And we do a little to protect that. And it's a very important public space. But we don't have much else. And so we don't have a great winter garden. Yes, the bank, some of the bank buildings provide that kind of enclosed public space like the TV or like the commerce. Union Station does. But they're not designed as a public space, they're designed for something else. So I think Montreal is doing quite well. But you had something behind your question, which I didn't get, I guess. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't disagree with you, but I shouldn't criticize that better.
as you probably know, uh, but I, um, I don't know the answer. But I know that uh, people feel strongly about it, and I understand that. I mean, having grass, natural grass, that sounds like... <coughs> the question is, is that intended for students, or is it intended for professional games to come and play them? And I assume that there's a larger agenda here being played out, not merely to change the grass to something artificial. Uh, I just came back from Barcelona and was very uh, you know, overwhelmed by La Sagrada Familia, by Gabi. La Sagrada Familia, the church, and I was wondering if you had any comment. It's so unusual. Gabi is one of those architects that has, in a sense, not part of the trends of the time. Not, he's not part of the zeitgeist of the modern movement, and is a brilliant plastic architect. I mean, the, uh, I don't remember the name of the apartment buildings that he did, but the way in which they, besides the kind of plasticity and the kind of eccentricity in which all hangs together as a brilliant artist composes something that has a fit and you want to change one iota, it sits this into the city, though, extraordinarily well. Those blocks in Barcelona, where they have the chamfered corners to create the intersection of bigger space, and give you view around the corner when you're driving or walking is phenomenal. I mean, Barcelona is one of the great cities. It's very extraordinary. And its scale of seven, eight stories consistently, like old parts of Paris, like Luzan, like uh, Zurich, I mean, it's really quite remarkable. So, his buildings, apart from the, the church the memorial, which is itself exceptional, but really entirely idiosyncratic, entirely he is an artist not part of a movement. You couldn't be a second Gaudi. You'd be a second not a great one. It's, it's, a, it's a piece on its own. It's not a part of a school. So it's difficult to comment because it is so special and so idiosyncratic. So. Do you have ideas uh, where a new public space in Toronto might be located? Yes, I thought that um, it would be wonderful if we could, in fact, enclose the City Hall Square for winter. Um, that we, there are wonderful light structures that could have... We did it over the dome for the dome stadium. And I think if the whole structure were a delicate skein of steel and glass, and I'll do that tomorrow too, um, that we could have a summer and a winter time place, I think that would be extraordinary. We've got such a severe, we have such extremes, blazing hot and freezing cold, that we need to develop an architecture that deals with that. The reason that Piazza in Italy works is the climate. <coughs> that's why it's pleasant to be out there at 5 or 6 o'clock on a summer's evening, for everybody giro, it's a gregarious activity. To a degree we have that on the waterfront. But go down there in the wintertime, and it's dead. So I think that ways in which we can get winter and summer, and it's not beyond the bounds of either technology or imagination, to create weather protected ways. In fact, I lost the battle on the East Bay front, where the front is too wide, way too wide. There's no microclimate protection. My sense is, as the planning of York, really better uh, plan that best fits Florida. I think in the winter, in the summertime, after they've cleared the snow and ice, I don't know if they're buddies that they picked up. They didn't make, they didn't make it across that, that ice field. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are, are, are back tomorrow night, and uh, at this point, I, I heard a, a few admiring pause at uh, some of the watercolors and not only will there be uh, refreshments available on the buttery but there also will be some books available for oh, really? purchase uh, including uh, watercolors and sketches by Jack Diamond and uh, your book with photographs. <coughs> so uh, please make your way to the buttery and uh, come back to us tomorrow.